Okay, so we are Kerr Creek Solutions, um, and uh, we're going to go over a basic overview of, overview of WWHM 2012 and go through a modeling scenario here. So let's just get started with it. Um, Clear Creek Solutions, just a little background. We were founded in 2005 by uh, Joe Brasher and Doug Byerline, and uh, Doug Byerline does most of our uh, educational material. So. to admit one more person in. Let's see. There must be a way to admit all. Okay, here we go. So as I was saying, uh, yeah, Doug Barline does most of our educational material. We do software development, hydrology, modeling, and stormwater modeling. We've been doing this, our company's been doing this for quite a while. And uh, there's over 60 plus years of experience between the senior founding members and then we developed WWHN 2012, or the Western Washington Hydrology Model, for the counties of Western Washington, as, many, as well as many numerous software packages for uh, jurisdictions along the West Coast and across the entire country. So that's just a quick background there. So what is WWHN 2012? Well, it's a continuous simulation software package that models the entire hydrologic cycle. So something people might be more familiar with is single event modeling. And what single event modeling is, is it's almost like a stormwater event completely in a vacuum. So imagine if you just had uh, a land use area where there was no water, no infiltration. It was basically a desert. Um, some rainfall rained on it, and then a certain runoff comes from that. So we're all familiar with like Q equals CIA, right, where there's a runoff coefficient and intensity and then a certain acreage. Well, continuous simulation actually is going to model that entire hydrologic cycle. And how it does that is, and specifically in WWHM, is through 15 minute time steps. So HSPF is actually the developmental engine for WWHM 2012. That's what it is based off of. And using continuous simulation methods uh, in WWHM 2012, we can more accurately model stormwater facilities and uh, perform water quality analysis because over the 60 plus years of rainfall data, that's why you download that the map files and the all the rainfall data is because we're using historical events to gauge what is going to happen in the future when certain stormwater event events occur. Because as we know, when a stormwater event occurs, it doesn't happen in completely dry and with the past not having an impact on it. Stormwater events that have come before and have impacted that land use are, are going to have an impact on how quickly the soil gets infiltrated and what kind of runoff it's produced. So in a continuous simulation software like WWHM 2012, we're relying on years of rainfall data and those 15 minute time steps to uh, gauge what is going to happen and get the, the flow ranges from that. So especially in Western Washington, what we want to know about is Department of Ecology's minimum requirements. And Department of Ecology actually has a great free video. I think it's three or four hours covering all nine minimum requirements. So that is a really useful resource um, to look at. Just admitting one more person here. Okay, excellent. So, um, like I said, Department of Ecology has a video on all nine of those minimum requirements. What we're more focused on in stormwater specifically with WWH in 2012 is minimum re requirements six, seven, and eight. Okay, hopefully that's the last person. We'll see. So we're looking at minimum requirements six, seven, and eight, runoff treatment, flow control, and wetlands protection. I'll go over how WWHM 2012 can help you with those. So as I said, um, it's at, not actually linked here, but if you look at Washington State Department of Ecology, minimum requirements, there's a whole um, course on that, really in-depth, uh, really well done. So here's all nine minimum requirements. Like I said, we're focusing on six, seven, and eight runoff treatment, flow control, and wetlands protection in WWHM 2012. So how can WWHM 2012 help you meet those minimum requirements? I'm going to get into that here. So the first one we're going to look at is um, minimum requirement number six, which is runoff treatment. Um, it's not the one we're going to do the modeling scenario on, but minimum requirement number six. Um, it, what we're trying to do in WWHM 2012 a lot of the time is meet 91% filtered for that certain runoff treatment. And we often use a bioretention facility to do this. You want to meet that 91% filter. We have other elements in the software 
that can also meet that 91% filter to uh, you know keep the water clean and keep the water quality um, upkeep. But what most people are fo focused on is minimum requirement number seven, which is flow control. And this is really uh, the important one because it's going to help prevent those erosive flows. So the Washington State Department of Ecology has determined that half of the two-year to the 50-year flow is the erosive flow range. And what they don't want to happen is though that flow range being exceeded in your developed scenario. So if you have a pre-developed scenario where it's just straight forest, it rains on that, stormwater events occur on that forest, and then there's runoff that's generated. There's a certain amount of runoff that occurs. There's a certain amount of erosion that occurs, but it's natural erosion. It's okay for our streams. But if we replace four of those acres with roads now, now we're getting more flows, we're getting more erosive flows, and more of that sediment is now collecting in our streams and uh, causing issues, causing problems. So the Department of Ecology wants us to model uh, these land use areas correctly and model it so that we don't create more of these erosive flows and reduces the pollution. So that's kind of the, the purpose of minimum requirement number seven. And then minimum requirement number eight is a wetlands protection, where it's going to try to prevent uh, the damage to these wetland habitats and for western washington generally we're trying to keep the wetland input volumes within plus or minus 15 percent of the initial wetland uh, condition and i'll show you a, a graph here real quick that'll kind of help you uh, visualize that Let's see i just want to make sure everything set up okay everyone is now in excellent okay so this is the flow control standard for minimum requirement number seven and you can see on the left here the blue graph and if you're familiar with WWHM 2012 you've probably seen this many times before but the blue line is representing your pre-developed flow your red line is representing that mitigated flow. And so you can see here that the red line is going past that blue line for many of the flows here and it, the facility is failing. So the program is, or WWHM 2012 is designed to show where your facility is failing or where your developed scenario is failing and what kind of stormwater mitigation methods you can maybe use to help that facility pass minimum requirement number seven. So if you look at the graph on the y-axis, we have the flow in cubic feet per second and the percent time exceeding. Um, essentially, what percent time exceeding is, is it's running all these 15-minute time steps and determining how often or how what percent of the time are these flow events being exceeded by your new facility and your pre-developed facility. It's, it can be a bit of a complicated concept, and we go more in-depth in it in our in-depth training. But those flow values are seen on the y-axis and the percent time exceeding is seen on the x-axis. So the graph on the left would show you that we don't have any mitigation methods installed because the facility is failing. And then if you look at the graph on the right, that red line is below that blue line. So the red line is that mitigated flow, that blue line. Oh, we got one person here. Okay. There we go, okay. So that red line is below that blue line showing that we are meeting minimum requirement number, number seven and it does pass for all those uh, various flow ranges. Then this is just a quick uh, outline of water quality analysis here. This would be a modeled bioretention facility which shows a 91% filtered and there are size water quality automated features in WWHN 2012s that, that will model your facility for you and make sure that you do meet that uh, percent filtered uh, amount. And then for minimum requirement number eight for wetlands, this is a graph showing different wetland input volumes through your pre-developed and then now your uh, developed scenario for your wetland input volume showing that um, it is within that plus or minus 15 percent. Maybe for different jurisdictions it could be different, but I'm familiar with plus or minus 15 percent for wetland, wetland input volumes to allow that uh, to pass. It's really going to depend on your jurisdiction as well though. Okay, so those are minimum requirements. We're gonna get into modeling 
Um, you can unmute your mic if you have any questions about that portion of the scenario I, or that portion of the presentation. I'll take a few questions on that. But if there's no questions, I will just I'll just get into modeling. So, okay, looks good. So now I will share. So this is um, WWHM 2012, and if someone in the chat, just make sure that uh, you're seeing that screen. WWHM 2012. I just want to make sure everyone uh, sees me modeling. So, okay, good. I got a thumbs up on that. I'm. Oh, the meeting chat is muted. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Let me unmute. Okay. Okay, so people able to unmute now. I'm more familiar with Zoom, so <laughs> making sure people can unmute. If you also also have a question, you can just put it in the chat, and I can answer it there for you because um, I have that pulled up as well. Okay. Now we're going to model a scenario here in WWHM 2012. So I'm just going to assume that uh, you don't have any modeling experience, which is fine. Everyone's going to have different degrees of modeling experience, but this was really meant to be a basic workshop anyway. So I have my schematic here when I pull up WWHM 2012. And the first thing we're going to do is select a location on the map, left click, um, this little patch right here just happens to be SeaTac Airport, and it has a precipitation factor of 1.000. So you're selecting a rain gauge, and the gauge is SeaTac. And if I click around here, um, you'll get different results for that. So I'll get SeaTac again, SeaTac again. Um, but what the precipitation factor is doing is it's understanding that even amongst the rain gauge, the elevation of that specific location is going to be different. It's not going to be the same. And we know rainfall and precipitation is going to be affected by elevation. So if we're you know, really high up, a you know, thousand feet up on a mountain and then closer to sea level, uh, the precipitation will be different even if the rain gauge is accounting for all that area. So um, that's the reason for the precipitation factor. It's just sort of correcting that based on your location. And, that's, and now we've derived um, our rain uh, data, our precipitation data for when we run uh, the model. Now if we go to the schematic here, you see there's a pre-developed and there's a mitigated scenario. The pre-developed shows uh, grass and trees. And then the mitigated scenario shows like a house and a pond, right? So that's pretty self-explanatory. What we're going to do is we're going to show a simple scenario where we're modeling to meet minimum requirement number seven for our flow control standard. So we have our land use basin. You're going to left click, left click again. You can drop the land use basin in your modeling space. I'm just going to name it pre-developed just for some clarity here. I also do want to mention on the map that site name, address, and city, this does not affect your project results at all. However, when you go to make a report of your project, um, it will then show up if you put uh, values in there. So if you want to put your site name, address, and city in your project, that will then show up in your report. And WWHM does auto-generate a report essentially to um, for your project. So that can be pretty useful. Anyways, I've dropped in my uh, basin and have misspelled it. There we go. Pre-developed. And here's what we're going to do for the scenario. We're going to put in four acres of sea forest flat or till soil. So there's four acres of sea forest flat. It's almost like this was just a you know empty lot with trees on it and then the a developers come along and they want to develop it. That's kind of the scenario that we're looking at here. So if we right click, we can go connect to point of compliance. And what connecting it to the point of compliance does, it just allows you to analyze uh, that specific element or that specific routing and I'm selecting surface flow and inner flow here and clicking connect. So now that's connected to the point of compliance. I'm going to run the scenario. So now it's generating that pre-developed data and then we're going to put in our developed land use. Okay, just checking the chat. Everything looks good. Okay, so now that is run. Now we're gonna left click and go to the mitigated scenario. Let's put in our land use basin. And now let's say that that patch of land that we had, that four acres of forest that was undeveloped, the developers come along and say, hey, I wanna put um, some uh, development, some homes there or something. You know, pretty common situation. So I've got my developed land use here. And here's what I'm gonna do with this. Let's say a half an acre of this 
uh, was left as forest. They just decided to do that. One acre was seed law and flat, so I've got one and a half acres. If you go to the bottom left of your basin form, you can see the pervious total area and the impervious total area down here, so that's pretty useful. Then let's say another acres of roads was being added, um, a half acre of roofs flat were being added to this, and then we're gonna we're gonna have a half acre of our driveways. Uh, we have half and yeah, half acre of our driveways, and then a half acre of sidewalks. So this is now our developed scenario. We're going to connect this to the point of compliance. And then we're actually going to run this and look at the analysis tab. Now, judging by what you've seen before, um, this will not meet minimum requirement number seven because we have all this extra impervious runoff now generated from the site. So it, it will absolutely uh, blow through the blue line, but that's fine. We know that now it's about just installing the stormwater mitigation method to um, meet minimum requirement number seven, essentially. So now we've run the scenario, let's go to the analysis tab here. And if we click point of compliance one, and we pull up the graph here, the, the default here, I just want to let you guys know is stream protection duration. So it'll, and stream protection duration is minimum requirement number seven, essentially. So there's that blue line. And there's that red line. So our facility completely failed, right? And we expected that. We added a whole bunch of impervious area to it, um, a whole much, whole bunch more runoff. So that is that is expected here. So how are we going to meet minimum requirement number seven? Well, we could add a detention facility, which is exactly what I'm going to do. This is a trapezoidal pond, and we're going to model this element here. So first thing I'm going to want to do is disconnect this from the point of compliance because now our our pond is the point of interest. Let's go connect element and you do that by right clicking, select connect element and then connect that to the pond here, just the surface flow and interflow for now. Okay, so how are we going to model this pond element? And there's a number of ways you can do this and um, it just is really going to be called upon what kind of project you're running and, and what you're trying to do. Um, a good place to start is by selecting quick pond and all quick pond does is fill the cells with values. It, it, it's not doing any calculations, it's the same every time. It's just allowing you to run the project again with with this element. So if I go connect to point of compliance here, um, we've got a 200 by 200 pond with a depth of seven feet. Now I'm going to run this scenario. So now all this runoff is now going to this detention facility. There's no infiltration selected, and this is really going to depend on as well um, where your project site is, because some project sites have really great uh, infiltrating soil and some project sites don't have good infiltrating soil, or maybe there's a certain restriction. Maybe there's um, you know, pollutant runoff heading into that detention facility, and then maybe there's a water table somewhere nearby, a high water table that you can't let it uh, infiltrate into. Um, so now that is finished, if we go to the analysis tab, we click on point of compliance one. And uh, if we look here, it'll perform better, but I don't expect this to pass at all. And I'll, and I'll explain why, um, mostly because it was just a randomly, or not randomly generated, but a uh, just a template generated pond, and it's not often going to work for your specific project. So there's the pre uh, there's pre-developed flow, there's the mitigated flow. You can see it did pass for some of the flows. We're we're getting closer, but it's uh, it's not nearly as close as it needs to be, and uh, it seems to be failing uh, quite a, quite a bit on the lower flows. And that's what you'll find. So someone might say, okay, it didn't pass for all these flows. What if we just made the facility bigger? And that's one option. So I'm just going to show you what that does. Let's say, okay, let's make this 300 feet by 300 feet. Let's let's see what this does. We run the scenario again.
So you can see this is a definitely an iterative process, um, and depending on the size of your project, maybe uh, we'll, we'll probably more, be more in depth than this. But this is just a, a basic, uh, you know, a basic project setup to sort of grasp the idea of minimum requirement number seven. So if we look at the graphs here for our pre-developed and uh, developed scenario, right? We made the facility bigger, right? So it's going to hold more water. So is, is that going to help? Well, we'll see. And sort of, it does help a little bit. Uh, we do pass for now half the flows. So someone might say, hey, what if we made it 400 by 400? But here, here's what's happening here. Um, you'll find that, yes, making the facility bigger will help it pass for more flows. But look how big this facility's gotten. It's 300 by 300. Who knows how big it needs to be to make it pass for all the flows. And you'll find that actually, um, even if I made this like 10,000 feet by 10,000 feet, it actually wouldn't pass for some of the smallest flows. What really is key is the outlet structure. How you design your outlet structure and your orifice is actually going to have the most impact on the size of your facility. Yes, bottom length and width uh, does matter, but um, these actually are in the end going to have a bigger impact on um, how well you're able to mitigate the facility. So here's the solution. So, um, so here's the solution to this situation. You're going to want to use auto pond or i mean you can design this by hand continue to modify the outlet structure and the orifice data go back run it and do it a million times or you can have auto pond do it for you so auto pond is our feature that allows you to size that pond to meet minimum requirement number seven and it's going to go through all these iterations that we've been seeing here so what i would suggest is for the most thorough analysis if you slide this slider all the way to the right that's going to take the most time, but it'll give you your best designed pond here. And what you'll find is that it's going to be messing a lot with this orifice structure data. And then you go create pond. And now this will begin to model your pond for you and help you meet that minimum requirement number seven. Now, if I drop this down here, as it begins to model, um, typically it'll modify these parameters, parameters while, the, while it's running. And you'll see the length and width actually come down quite a bit because it's modifying that outlet structure data. So that's going to be really the key to modeling a situation like this would be using AutoPond. But like I said, you can, um, you know, use you know a by hand iterative process to change that length and width and to modify um, your facility here. You'll find that some other elements in WWH in 2012, like our storage tank. And our vault and our bioretention have some of those automated features and then some don't but we just want to um, put those in there because it really is going to drop your modeling time down uh, quite a bit when you're able to do that unless you have a really uh, specialized project or you're dealing with an existing facility that you need to to put the dimensions in for um, we did not i also want to note we did not enable infiltration for this facility like i said once we enable infiltration things actually start to get uh, quite complicated or it's, it's just a much more in-depth analysis, but may apply uh, to your project. So this is going to take, I mean, I may not have this go um, the, the full way. It usually takes maybe five to 10 minutes for AutoPond to finish sizing uh, a facility of this size. But as you can see here, a bottom length and width are already down uh, to 77 by 77. So that's a big uh, decrease from where we were 300 by 300 is a, we're getting, getting to be a pretty large facility. Um, 76 by 76 it's a pretty uh, much more manageable the cost is going to be uh, quite a bit down so while this models um, if anyone has any questions about um, WWHM anything uh, related to that clear creek solutions or modeling you could definitely uh, put it in the chat or just uh, unmute your mic it's up to you but um, or you can just watch this okay we got a question here the program on my terminal keep showing messages like too many zero, zeros yet if clicking on on okay then it keeps giving graphic analysis or generating reports do I need to worry about the analysis itself it's a program on my terminal just showing messages like too many zeros um, there are some situations where it will it will give too many zeros if clicking on okay then it keeps giving graph um, I guess I would just have to know what your project looks like. So our, um, this is, sorry if I pronounce your name wrong, uh, Weming Bayan, it's probably not how you pronounce your name. Um, I would probably have to know what your project looks like. Are you, are you running 
my scenario or is this a different scenario that you're running? Um, because if it's your own project and, and you're getting a message like that, then sometimes it's just good for us to look at it so you can um, e email us that WDM file and we'll tell you why it's giving you uh, that message. Um, the best way to transfer You plan to run a scenario with a wetland as one point of compliance. I think we'll need to use WHM soon for that kind of situation. Women says basically same smaller project. Thanks. Um, yeah, sometimes with really, really uh, much smaller projects, it will it will say. I'm meant to be separate. That yeah, no problem. Um, sometimes with really small projects, you will get that um, message, and then it'll tell you that and continue to analyze it just because there's just so little runoff that sometimes it's it's tough for it to um, model it correctly. Um, if you're worried about it, just like I said, send us, send us an email, um, you know, reply to brasherjr at clerkysolutions.com and I can help you uh, make sure everything's running smoothly uh, with that. But yeah, you will get that. I'm just planning to run a, with a wetland scenario as one point of compliance. So I did not plan on running a wetland scenario here. We have um, some wetland mod modeling in our more uh, advanced courses, but I will explain um, kind of how that's done because I've worked on wetland projects before. Um, basically, my experience with it is you you set up your wetland area in a pre-developed scenario. Um, you you run it and right. We're not trying to meet flow duration seven, obviously, so we're just going to run it there. Um, and then whatever changes is happening to your project in your developed scenario, you include that in the developed scenario but also have your wetland area. And sometimes it can be in the form of a basin. It will depend on your project, but it'll be in the form of a basin. And then you can have the points of compliance connected to your first wetland in the pre-developed scenario and your wetland in the mitigate scenario, uh, run them both. And then you can check the, the wetland input volumes and um, see if it's within, within the range there. That will give you a good idea if uh, you have a chance with your um, wetlands of meeting minimum requirement number eight. So there's a lot of complications when it comes to modeling wetlands and also how it's receiving that water, especially in the developed scenario, because if there's a lot of impervious runoff heading to that wetland, there's actually some, some better ways to do it. Um, so it, it really might depend. I have Mark Opes and he said, in what scenario do you need to add the pond surface to the impervious surface area for the model? This is a great question. I was hoping I'd get this question. So um, this is running here. I think maybe I can pull up the basin while I do this. Let's see here. So what I, what I have here is a half acre of forest and I have all these impervious areas. What I maybe could have done for this scenario is instead of saying, okay, there wasn't a half acre of sidewalk flat in this scenario and I could have gone let's do a half acre of pond um, I definitely could have done that it would it's all the same area so all the impervious area acts the same so water is considered to be impervious area uh, in the model so maybe a 100% a more accurate way of me doing this would say was saying um, okay actually there wasn't sidewalk in that impervious um, or in the developed scenario excuse me there wasn't sidewalk and I should have put a half acre aside for my pond, that probably would have been a, a better way to do this. Because like I said, all the impervious area is the same. So you really want to keep track of it. If you have a weird scenario where, it, or if you have a scenario where you have your pre-developed and then your developed scenario, it's all pervious area again, and then you're modeling the pond, you'll want to make sure you set aside a chunk of that area to be impervious. Then watch the size of your pond, because we'll get done here 1.216 acre feet, or you can actually open up the pond table to see how much area that's taking up, and then you can adjust, make the pond area bigger or smaller, and then credit it back more towards um, your other areas in the project. That was kind of a long answer. Mark, you can you can um, reply again if that didn't completely answer your question, but hopefully that was, that was an okay explan explanation of that. But that is a great point. A uh, woman says, fund a few facilities include, um, fund a few facilities include outlet structure. 
particularly the infiltration trench, the correct input to deactivate the riser and orifice because the agency criteria is fully infiltrated. Fund a few facilities include outlet stra um, If you could reword that question, I don't, I don't exactly. The correct input. Oh, means no outlet. Okay. So no riser outlet structure for the infiltration trench. Um, could you just retype that question out? I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm being a little dense. I just want to make sure I understand uh, what you're trying to say. Mark says, great, basically it is an iterative process. Absolutely is an iterative process because um, the pond area will change. You'll have to go back, change what it looks like in your, in your project and sort of try and, and there is a point where it will all converge and it will all make sense, but uh, He's right. It just will take a, a few going back and forth, but that's a, uh, that's part of the gig, I guess. So you can see auto ponds still running. It'll be done here shortly. Um, where it's getting everything, uh, uh, matched up here. So now it's down to 74 by 74. Most of the work has done with the orifice diameter and you'll find that just the, the smallest changes in the orifice diameter are really going to have an impact. I'll send an email to explain. That's fine. Just send me an email. That's and I'll, and I can talk to you about it too. Um, just to make sure I I fully understand what you're trying to say. We understand that um. You know this is all this is there's some complicated things here and um you know Washington Department of Ecology has has their way of doing things and then we're trying to implement it correctly in the model and and sometimes it doesn't always. Um, 100% translate between the two. So we want to make sure we can uh, help people with that. Okay. Okay, so Autopon's finished. That's great. About time, right? But it's actually pretty quick for, um, if you understand how much iter how much iteration, how much uh, the algorithm is doing, uh, Autopon is actually uh, pretty impressive. Obviously for a larger project, it's, uh, it's going to take more time. But it's done here. If we go to our analysis tab, we go to POC1. And uh, we look at those those scenarios here. I see someone has a question, I'll get to that in a second. So as you can see, it passes for all the scenarios here, right? So this is, yeah, this is a basic modeling scenario, but that's kind of what this uh, this was intended for. But basically now our facility is passing. Um, it's 74 by 74 with a six inch, or excuse me, six feet. Um, that happens sometimes, make, the riser heights in feet, the riser diameter is in inches. So make sure that we don't get that confused um, with the 1.054 diameter. Um, if you were to run the scenario and you were to go in and just barely change that that diameter in inches, it would it would make a, a big difference when it comes to um, how this facility is going to finally perform. Now, when I was talking about um, going back and making sure that putting the pond in, in as impervious area, this is what I meant by opening the table. If you down click here, this will allow you to show the stage and area, and this will get to give you a good idea for what stage and acres the pond's at. So if you go to the highest stage. The, ac the pond is 0.31 acres in size. So if I were to do that the way Mark had it, or the, the way Mark was explaining here, maybe I didn't have any of the sidewalks flat. I had 0.5 set aside for pond. Now nothing would have changed in the modeling aspect because it's all impervious area. But now maybe I could go in and say, okay, that pond's going to be 0.31 now. Um, maybe I have some area to spread somewhere else or just continue to leave half an acre aside for that pond. So that would have been how that could have gone. It's an advantage to use multiple orifices, especially when trying to manage the smaller flows. Um, it can. I think if you go to auto pond, you can choose um, some different orifice outlet structures here. Um, but that is a good question. I don't I don't have a ton of experience modeling with, with multiple orifices, but that can have an uh, impact when it comes to those smaller flows. Um, if I can't 100% answer your question here, I will um, ask some of the developers and I'll also get back to you on that, but that is a good question. Uh, 
Um, someone also asked about wetlands, and um, I do have a little bit of time, but we've been getting a lot of questions on wetland modeling because it is, um, it's actually pretty, co this is pretty complicated. Um, so we are trying to put together instructional material to make sure that um, people can learn how to use the wetlands because there's a lot of way to do it. So we all, also, all are also working on that. Um, but since someone asked a question, what I was just trying to explain was that I would put the wetland here in the pre-developed scenario, set up whatever your mitigated scenario looked like. Um, I'm not not sure what it would look like, but it might contain a whole bunch of things. And then setting up your, your wetland again, connecting to the point of compliance. I'm just going to delete these elements just to make sure people don't get uh, confused. And then you can go here and look at wetland input volumes and you can kind of look at that curve and it'll give you an idea. That would just be uh, my opinion on how to do it, but there's a lot of ways to model wetlands, including um, when we're talking about maybe dispersion fields involving wetlands. Maybe if you have area going to a dispersion field, then going to a wetland, you're actually going to want to use lateral basins to do that because now there's a, ge a geographical location assigned um, to that wetland runoff. Like I said, it can get pretty involved. Since not all ponds are not square, could one use that 0.31 acres to create a kidney beam shape, for example? Uh, yes, I believe so. Well, that's, there's a bit, uh, nuance because when I was looking at the table, this is assuming this is assuming a square shape when it relates to this stage and area and acres. So if I change that to a kidney beam shape and I change the length and width, I'm not exactly 100% sure how that would come out, but that would be um, interesting. It does, the, the model definitely has wiggle room for you to change um, the length and width, but I know that when you're looking at the stage storage relationship, um, if you begin to change that length and width, that, that may begin to change in the algorithm. I'm not 100% sure on that. So um, if you send me an email about that on a, uh, about that again, I will ask our developers and make sure that um, I'm 100% correct on that. But that, that is a good question. What's the difference in how to apply the two basic elements, lateral impervious area and lateral soil basin? Okay, well, I guess I can go into lateral impervious a little bit. So I will just, well, I can show it. Can I? So they asked about lateral impervious area. Okay. So this is the lateral impervious flow basin. And it's going to ask you to select the area immediately. Let's just assume this is um, Rhodes flat. So what is happening with a lateral basin is, and this has to do with a lot um, with how HSPF works, which is what WWHM 2012 is based off of. HSPF was developed um, all the way back in the 70s as sort of the first continuous simulation um, runoff method for us, for us to use. And so this kind of has to do with a little bit of what's going on in HSPF, which is that it's assigning a location or geographical relationship that has to do with your area because if you think about your land use area right this is four acres of sea forest flat does it really matter where it is with relation to your project no there's no real geographical location assigned yes we're, we're selecting a location on the map but there's no visualization of where this sea forest flat is or if you go to mitigate scenario um, we have one acres of roads flat. We have half roads, half driveways, uh, half forest, but we don't really understand where they are with relation to each other. We just know it contains this land use area. So when you drop something in like a lateral basin, now we're sort of getting into the world of, okay, now we're assigning a, a geographical location of this impervious area and where it goes. So for example, let's say I had a uh, let's say this was a parking lot and you want to use it as a lateral impervious flow basin. Well, now that I've dropped it in, you would assign it land use area, but now this area has to go somewhere. And remember, it can't go, it can't go to this basin. It can't go straight to the pond because now there's a geographical relationship that has to do with it. So what typically happens is we've got this lateral area and then we might drain it to 
a lateral pervious area. That's right, you have to select the soil type. Okay. So let's say that we had a parking lot, we're laterally draining it to, um, let's say this is a park or this is just some lawn or something like that. We can do that connecting the surface flow, right? Because it's uh, it's lateral impervious. There's not going to be any groundwater or anything like that unless we're using um, a, a different element. But so now it's draining onto this pervious area here. And then now we can finally direct it to maybe a stormwater uh, mitigation method from there. It's something to keep in mind when you're draining area laterally, especially to a pond, there will be um, how big that lateral area is will impact how your pond um, ends up modeling because some of that water will, as it passes through that lateral pervious flow basin, some of that will infiltrate through the ground. And so it will prevent, it will allow for some flow mitigation method to occur. But that's sort of a, a basic overview of the lateral basin. I hope I answer your question there and the lateral soil basin is that the lateral um, pervious flow element you're referring to or is there one I'm missing lateral soil basin because this is the uh, that's the permeable pavement maybe referring to the to the calves I'm not sure but hopefully that that gives you a little better understanding of of that element we cover all this in our um, in our course the WWHM 2012 Academy um, but that's my best explanation of it. No, just from the two buttons looks very much alike. Yeah, they do. They do look a bit alike. I, I can understand that. Um, there's a road. Yeah, there's a road there to show um, impervious, and then yeah, but they do have the the arrow the arrows. I get that. Okay. Um, does anyone have any more modeling questions? And then I have a little bit of a. Um, a special offer for you guys at the end here but if anyone has any more model question modeling questions I'll do my best to answer it and if not you can send me an email and I'll make sure that our the developers will make sure that I uh, get all the facts right about what's going on because there's a lot going on with the software but these are all good questions so far and good feedback for us okay so that is how to set up and model a basic pond. That was also an overview of a few other elements. I hope that was uh, that was valuable for you. What I'm going to do here. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to share the PowerPoint again. So we did a little bit of modeling. Um, hopefully I answered any questions you guys had to the best of my ability like I said please send me an email and I can totally help you um, as I consult with my developers on that um, but we do have a special offer our on our instructional course which is called WWHM 2012 Academy it's taught by Doug Byerline it's based off his live workshops that he does um, you know on a, on a semi yearly basis um, it includes six to seven hours of instructional material there there's also some basic lessons um, for people just getting into the software, but he's going to cover more of these elements in depth in a course like that. So if you go to uh, www.clearcreeksolutions.com and you use the code CCSLIVE10, you can get 10% off uh, that course. So that's the WWHM 2012 Academy. That's one of the courses we offer. We also do offer in-person training uh, as well for your company or jurisdiction. Um, so yeah, the WWHM Academy, it just covers um, you know, it's our flagship course. You can learn the in and outs of the model and uh, get a more complete understanding of uh, continuous simulation and uh, all the aspects of uh, how all the elements work together. So that's our one course there. And then we've just released a course um, called the Bioretention Masterclass. And this is a complete course on how to model bioretention facilities because we got a lot of questions on that. Um, this is a, a course that's much more to the point. It's just on bioretention. Doug Byerline and uh, Joe Brasher are our CEO, they take you through how to mo model bioretention, com completely describe everything in the form. They give you five pretty in-depth modeling scenarios. Doug Byerline does a great job on the background of the bioretention facility. And so you can find that course um, at clearcreeksolutions.info, the bioretention masterclass. If you use that same code, the CCS Live 10, um, you can also get 10% off uh, that course, which is a, a pretty good deal. So 
that's some of the instructional material that we offer now. Um, we're also here to answer as many questions as possible for you, but I, I thank everyone for attending the workshop and uh, I'm not gonna drag it on any longer than, than it needs to be for people, but I, I thank you for attending. And then um, if you have any more questions, you can, you can shoot them to me now. Um, but yeah, that's basically all I had planned, so. Okay, let's see. Thank you, absolutely. We want to do our best to give people an understanding of uh, WWHM and what's going on. But So thank you for attending. This is, uh, yeah, absolutely. This tells me that, um, you know, that people appreciate our help. Email address, okay, let me put it, yeah, let me put it in the chat. That's very smart. Well, gotta get, make sure I get my email address right. So that's my email address. And then we also have a support email if you go to So that is our website. If you go to contact there, you can also contact our um, support email there. But that's my personal email. Please send anything uh, there. That's fine. I'm willing to, to answer any questions about that. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Any other links I can put in here for anyone? Um, it's the main website, I think. Are there continuing education credits available for participation in this presentation? Uh, no, not yet, but um, there are continuing education credits available for our courses, the WWHM 2012 Academy, and for the Bioretention Masterclass, there are uh, accreditation options available for that. So yeah, I wasn't able to do it for um, for this one, but they are available for that. And so we'll work to uh, make sure any any presentations we do in the future, you can earn accreditation for. That That's a very good point. But for our um, paid courses and for Doug Byerline's courses, and uh, you can get accreditation for those. I was trying to obtain free copy for Contra Costa model. Okay, well, let me look into that here. Because I think Contra Costa hydrology model. Yeah, our option on the website is purchase. Um, so Contra Costa should be free. Is that what you're referring to? It's just provided by your jurisdiction. Just want to make sure I get that right. Um, yeah, if you have a question about trying to get the Contra Costa model, then uh, you can go ahead and email me and we'll, we'll work that out for you. But yeah, it does say, it does say purchase on our site right now, so maybe I can um, help uh, resolve that issue. Yes, I thought it'd be free for local government. Okay, I, I'm i I'm sure it is. Uh, email me and I'll, I'll talk to our um, sales department, make sure that that all gets worked out for you. So you're Shane. Okay, just email me and be like, yeah, yep, we'll get that worked out for you. Sometimes, sometimes things don't go incorrectly on the website. So, um, what was I talking? Oh yeah, I was. Yeah, thank, thank you. You're welcome. Absolutely. Um, yes. You, if you go to ClearCreeksolutions.info and if you go to any of our courses, we have a description on how you can earn uh, accreditation for those for those courses. And for Washington, I believe um, it's just you have to use your your judgment and complete an exam or something. Is what is what I've seen. So yeah, there was no exam at the end of this presentation. So, but anyways, if that's uh, that's all people have, then uh, excellent. You can send that to the email there. Let me put the support email up real quick. Uh, let's see here.